Each of our panelists today is approaching the issue of plastics pollution from a, a different perspective, but we're working together on a common goal. I'm David Clark, the Vice President of Sustainability at Amcor. We're a manufacturer of primary packaging for consumer packaged goods. And I have with me today, Sander Defruit, who's the uh, lead of the New Plastics Economy Initiative with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, Alan Langdon, the President and CEO of Encorp Pacific, who is based here in Vancouver and Kevin Rabinovich, the Global VP of Sustainability with Mars. Packaging plays a really important role in many of our businesses and in people's lives today. People today are healthier and they're living longer than ever before in history. And a big reason for that is the way we produce, store, ship, and consume food, medicine, and, and other products. Uh, the properties of plastics, the fact that they're cost efficient, lightweight, have great barrier properties, they're strong and very often have a low carbon footprint, have made plastics the materials of choice for many consumer packages. But those same properties that are so wonderful for packaging mean packaging and plastics are a problem when they get into the environment. That lightweight me means they move around with the wind or they move in water. Those same barrier properties and strength that are wonderful for packaging mean they last a long time in the environment, sometimes for years or hundreds of years. The problems seem difficult and really complex, and that's because in many cases they are. Solutions will require all of us working differently, but the good news is these types of problems have been solved by others in other situations before, and we can learn from those. When accidents rate, accident rates peaked back in the 1970s, airline operators were at a crisis point. They were faced with a problem none of them could solve on their own. If any individual player had a record of zero accidents, they were still facing public opinion about the safety of air traffic. The airlines made a decision and they decided to set aside competition and work together in the area of safety. Manufacturers, regulators, the airline operators and others all came together. And today the aviation industry continues to improve the safety of air flight by sharing knowledge and standardizing many parts of their business. Today, we're going to put forward a compelling case for action, collaborative action, that all of us in this room can help to accelerate. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us. Um, Kevin Rinovich, I lead what we call the Healthy Planet Program at Mars. So basically, it's all things environment. So uh, packaging, deforestation, renewable energy, you know, everything you can think of, it's, it's part of the portfolio. I think it's, it's useful to uh, sort of anchor ourselves in how did we get where we are uh, because I think that'll help us inform how do we then get to where we want to be. Um, you know, and, and I think really part of why we are where we are is uh, a little bit of a failure of imagination. Um, you know, so, so I've worked in, in sustainability at Mars for the last 12 years. Before that, I worked in R&D. And in my last role in R&D, I actually had responsibility for, for packaging development for our, uh, for our North American pet business. And so I, I have sort of firsthand knowledge of what our design constraints were for, for packaging, what we were trying to accomplish. You know, we were after food safety. We were after light weighting, um, both because it drove an environmental benefit. We're using less resources. And because in many cases it drove an economic benefit. It was lower cost. We want shelf life. We want it to look pretty on the shelf. We want the consumer engagement with the packaging. You know, so there are sort of all these constraints. And when you do the, the overlap, the Venn diagram, there tended to be quite a small spot in the middle. And that spot was occupied for most of our products by thin plastic flexible films. Um, you know, that was the, the thing that fixed all the things that we were, we were trying to solve for. Um, and, and so that's how we got to, to where we got to. The failure of imagination, I think, comes that our thinking about how that package behaved and performed really stopped somewhere around those left two pictures of, of what it looks like going into distribution and what it looks like in the hands of the consumer. And you know, the consumer tears open the package of whatever it is, consumes the product, and, and that's kind of where the movie that was playing in our heads ended, you know, credits roll, because consumers now have the product and everything's great. But the reality, of course, is there's a sequel. <laughs> and the sequel is the consumer's left holding this empty package and they have to do something with it. Um, and, and really, we didn't design our packaging thinking about that sequel. Um, at the same time, um, the, the picture on the right there is from a, uh, a materials recovery facility or a MRF for those that, that know the lingo. 
um, that uh, supports the city of San Francisco. So it's, it's one of the better berths in, in the U.S. from a technology and, and you know, well-run sort of thing. And, and, you know, if you look carefully, you can see that M&M peanut butter wrapper in there and that Skittles wrapper in there. Um, the folks that designed those systems weren't thinking about our packaging either. Right? They were thinking about the things that, that generate revenue for them, which are the easy to identify, heavier packages like PET bottles and, and things like that. So, so they weren't designing for us, we weren't designing for them. So it's not entirely surprising that the system didn't work the way anyone was planning because no one was planning. That's the, the challenge for us going forward is to, now that we have a better understanding of, of what that lack of planning on both sides, uh, you know, to, to deal with small flexible packages or plastic more generally, now that we have an understanding of the consequences of that, we need to redesign the system. Um, frankly, the, probably the biggest tension and the biggest risk is that some of the most obvious ways that you would redesign to, to make things more circular and to drive better recycling, unsolve some of the problems that we solved when we went to lightweight film. So, you know, a Snickers bar wrapper is maybe half a gram. So we could replace that with a 15 or 20 gram rigid plastic tube made out of PET, which you know, would be quite happily recycled in a PET bottle system. But we're now using 30 times as much plastic, which is not gonna be good for our economics or the price consumers have to pay for the product. And you know, using 30 times more plastic doesn't sound like the right answer either. And so the challenge for us is how do we solve for this new constraint without unsolving for, for some of the problems that, or, or opportunities that we've already solved for. Or one of the things that, that gives me um, actually great hope about the, the direction that we're all collectively going and trying to tackle this problem is uh, the degree of collectivism uh, that's becoming part of the narrative here. And, and, and you know, I think we have to give a lot of credit to, uh, to the new plastics economy for, for helping drive this. My name is Alan Langdon. I'm the president and CEO of Return It, and I'm the recycler on the panel. So, you know, if I think what the new plastics economy is doing is great and certainly setting the stage for um, making a, a, a kind of building momentum for changing the packaging. Um, my organization and people I represent have to do with the other. We have to actually take that packaging and make it into new, into new packaging or other products. So uh, we operate the deposit return program for beverage containers here in BC, as well as manage the electronics and the major appliance recycling program. And we're actually this year celebrating our 25th anniversary of leading extended producer responsibility. Do people know what extended producer responsibility is? Can I have a show of hands? Okay. I will give you just a brief 30 second overview, but essentially what it means is in jurisdictions, it's common across Europe and in BC as well, producers have been obligated to take responsibility for ensuring that there are systems in place to recycle their products and packaging. So we have 20 programs here that recycle everything from uh, tires to paint to batteries and packaging. And all of that's mandated by government, but it's actually operated by third parties, most of us nonprofits, who do that on behalf of the obligated brand owners. So brand owners are responsible for making sure systems are in place, and then they work through collective agencies like ourselves to actually execute that, ensure that recycling takes place in the province. So shifting to circular economy requires development of sustainable systems for the recovery of products and packaging. And, you know, as I said before, much of today's systems are operated in ad hoc manner, in most part because it's been the responsibility has been shifted onto these local governments. And that means that all the good work and many significant commitments, some of them through the new plastics economy, uh, being implemented to shift towards recyclable packaging are not going to make as much of a meaningful difference if there's no system in place to responsibly recycle and recover this material. So extended producer responsibility is kind of a, a, a process. What makes it different than, say, a traditional regulatory approach is that it can succeed because it offers a more flexible solution. It really sets benchmarks, objectives, and then it allows industry working through collective organizations to determine what might be the best approach. It offers a platform for companies uh, to leverage and further advance the sustainability of their products and or their packaging through a more circular model of production and renewal. Let me start by stating the obvious, and that is that our current plastics economy is broken. It's clearly very wasteful. If we look at plastic packaging, just 14% globally is collected for recycling. Just 2% is recycled at high enough quality to go back into packaging. A staggering one third is ending up in the environment and more than half is landfilled or incinerated. So the statistics today don't look very bright, but I'm not here to talk about the issues. Um, I'm here to talk about solutions because it's very clear that we need to fundamentally rethink the way we produce, use, and reuse plastics. 
And one thing that is really positive is that with the launch of the new plastics economy global commitment, more than 400 organizations are now all aligned on one common vision of how to address this issue. It's a vision of a circular economy for plastics as the root cause solution to address plastic waste at the source. So not just treating the symptoms, but addressing the issue at the source. The group of 400 organizations that signed the global commitment includes around 200 businesses that collectively represent more than 20% of all plastic packaging put on the market globally. And that includes most of the biggest uh, consumer goods brands, retailers, packaging producers, etc. It includes governments from across five different continents, major financial institutions and investors with more than four trillion of US dollars of assets under management. It also includes organizations like UN Environment, the World Economic Forum, WWF, as well as the Consumer Goods Forum. And having a critical mass of stakeholders aligned behind one common vision is an absolutely crucial first step if you want to change a global system with so many actors involved. Creating a circular economy for plastics will require much more than just better waste management or better recycling. They all recognize that recycling is an important part of the solution, but equally recognize that we will not simply recycle our way out of this. They recognize we need to eliminate the plastics that we don't need, the simply unnecessary items or the most problematic packaging materials or designs. They recognize we need to innovate the plastics that we do need, making sure all of them are reusable, recyclable, or compostable, and including a significant shift from single-use to reuse business models wherever relevant. And finally, they recognize we need to circulate all the materials we put on the market, making sure they are also reused, recycled, or composted in practice, so that we keep them in our economy and out of the environment, landfills, or incinerators. The second commitment they made is to shift from single-use to reuse business models wherever relevant. And this is an area, if we look at the past decades, um, where we really need to scale up our efforts because we've seen a lot of efforts over the past decades going into better recyclability, better recycling, which is absolutely crucial and we should continue doing. But we need an equal amount of efforts going into the move from single-use to reuse business models. And the third important element of, that came out of the research is that you should not be doing reuse models for the sake of the environmental benefits only. There's real business benefits to be captured. We've looked at more than 100 case examples and saw many of them leading to cost savings, leading to significant increase in consumer uh, loyalty, leading to uh, better consumer analytics, leading to uh, more functionalities or convenience offered to their consumers. So there's real benefits to be captured uh, by going to reuse models. The question is not whether a world without plastic waste is possible. The question is what are we going to do together to make it happen, because together we can create a new plastics economy. Thank you.